yesterday marked the start of the UK Srebrenica Memorial Week in which hundreds of memorial activities are taking place across the UK in places of worship, community centres, schools, police stations, prisons, places of work um, and local authorities to mark the 26th anniversary of the genocide in Srebrenica where due to hate over 8,372 Bosnian Muslims were murdered and thousands more met a similar fate across Bosnia. Between 20 to 50,000 women were raped and 2 million people were di displaced. This was the worst atrocity on European soil since the Second World War. We've been organising a small memorial event at Shakespeare Martino ever since I visited Bosnia seven or so years ago in order to remember the victims, to honour the survivors and raise awareness about the importance of rejecting hatred and building more cohesive communities. The genocide deniers don't want us to do this. They don't want us to remember the victims or raise awareness about the importance of rejecting hatred because they are ultimately motivated from a place of hate. The memorial theme for this year is rebuilding lives. When I visited Sarajevo, we found on many street corners these street vendors who had picked up countless shells from the bullets discharged by the Serbs during the siege of Sarajevo and made them into pens. The symbolism of converting a bullet into a pen is a lasting symbolism that I, I took from Bosnia. Um, that You can physically kill us but you will never break our spirit. This year we're honoured to be joined by editor Maric. Editor uh, was only three when fighting erupted in Bosnia and the place of her birth in Mostar. We'll get to hear from her on the real cost and legacy of hate and on this year's theme of rebuilding lives. We will learn that crimes against humanity took place throughout Bosnia and not just in Srebrenica. Editor Marriage holds a LLM degree from the University College London. Um, in 2013 she acquired a LLB degree in International and Comparative Law from the American University in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Editor has since amassed a wealth of experience both in academia where she secured prestigious scholarships as well as in private and public practice. Editor has published several articles on the topics of international arbitration and the ethical consideration of arbitrate arbitrators, the legal profession and on the reform of the legal system in Bosnia. She also contributes thought pieces on human rights including recently having made a contribution on um, the plight of the Palestinian people. Before I hand it over to editor, I'd like Alma also to say a few words on behalf of Remembering Srebrenica and this year's theme of re rebuilding lives. Alma is a survivor of the genocide and despite the horrors endured, she was able to rebuild her life by focusing on justice and community instead of hatred and intolerance. Alma, can I hand over the mic to you please? afternoon everyone uh, I hope I hope you can hear me and I also hope you can understand me I do have a Scottish accent so sometimes I, I, I get it from uh, the down south that I'm not the most easy to understand but nonetheless it's an absolute pleasure to be here and thank you Mohammed for a wonderful introduction I, I think you covered a lot of the points that we normally do so my name is Amina Mukanovic and I am what some would refer to as a second generation survivor. Um, I'm also the events manager for Remembering Srebrenica, which is an organization that was founded in 2013 and works to promote uh, sharing the story of Srebrenica and Bosnia as a whole in order for people to learn about the events that took place and tackle hatred and intolerance within our society today. Unfortunately, even uh, uh, in recent days, we've seen rises in, in such events with Islamophobia and anti-Semitism amongst hate crime growing repeatedly. Um, unfortunately, you'd think that in, in this day and age, we'd be able to overcome this and live as one, but we have so many different organizations and groups of people across the world, including the UK, that are seeking to divide us. So as an organization, we use the lessons from Srebrenica in order to challenge this narrative. And more often than not, to echo the voices of the survivors that promote peace, uh, despite everything that they've gone through with 
some survivors having lost over 100 members of their immediate families uh, to this day having to search for the remains of their loved ones and fight for even the most basic of, of rights or reclaiming their lands and having their human rights upheld. Um, to, to this day, we're still having court verdicts being held. Just uh, a few weeks ago, Radko Mladic, arguably one of the orchestrators of the Srebrenica genocide, had his appeal verdict after being on the run for decades. Um, justice is a very interesting term uh, when it comes to the Bosnian genocide. And I hope that with the, the wonderful Adita today, you will get an insight into what life is like for a, a survivor and someone that also lives in Bosnia today and, and works uh, in the atmosphere. Um, so thank you all once again for, for coming and for having us and for, for continuing this tradition, I'd like to say, of hosting an event and at Shakespeare Martin U to commemorate the genocide. I'll hand over the mic to Ed. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, for the introduction. And thank you, Amra and Nikki, uh, for having me today. Uh, I'm really and truly honored to be here. Um, so besides sharing my personal story today with you, uh, I would also like to provide, with you, uh, provide you with some concrete examples of uh, genocide denial and historical revisionism in our society, as well as the implications and in the end, I would like to somehow um, send a more positive note on how we can actually um, live together, move forward, uh, and uh, at least try to rebuild our lives in, in, in Bosnian society. So I was born uh, in Mostar in 1990. Uh, for almost three years before the 1992 aggression against my homeland, I lived with my parents in Mostar. We lived a happy life filled with love and care. I have no memories, but the photos and memories shared with me by my loved ones who have survived the war confirm so. We lived at a time when it did not matter which side of the city we lived on or what name, religion, or any other characteristics we were affiliated with. However, what is very important to mention is that we lived on the western side of Mostar uh, and that we were, we are Bosnian Muslims or Bosniaks. On May 9th, 1993, the siege of Mostar began by the Croatian Defense Council or HVO in an attempt to create greater Croatia and to ethnically cleanse the area of Bosnian Muslims and other non-Croats. The entire leadership of the so-called parastate uh, Herceg Bosna, declared by Croatian nationalists at that time, was sentenced in 2018 to a total of 111 years for a joint criminal enterprise and crimes against, against humanity including murders, rape, sexual assault, the destruction of property, and deportation of Bosniaks uh, in the period between 1993 to 1994. So we were forcefully expelled from the apartment where we lived, uh, me with my family. My father was taken to a concentration camp. In order to save our lives, I had to flee to Germany with my mother in 1993, and that is how we became refugees. My first memory of Mostad is from 1997 when we came back from, from Germany. It was actually the first time uh, when we went back and that's when my memories of Bosnia start. In relation to the events in Mostad, ICTY, the International uh, Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, found that uh, during the evictions of Bosnian Muslims from West Mostar, which was claimed at that time by Croats uh, to East Mostar, HVO soldiers exercised so-called extreme violence. The Muslims were uh, awakened in the middle of the night or early in the morning, beaten and forced out of their homes, often in their pajamas. Many women, including one 16-year-old girl, 
were raped by HVO soldiers. Between June 1993 and April 1994, the HVO laid siege, siege to East, East Mostar. Muslim population living there was subject to intensive and constant shelling, which left many civilians either wounded or dead. Tens of thousands of people went missing as a result of the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina from 1992 to 1995. According to International Committee of the Red Cross data uh, based on tracing requests submitted by families, 6,126 families are still waiting for information about the fate of their 6,586 missing relatives. Unfortunately, me and my mother are one of those families. We are still searching for my father's remains. And up to this date, we have no data, nothing whatsoever to what happened to him or even any, any clue what could have happened to him. As survivors, we are confronted with constant denial and historical revisionism. Denial of the war crimes committed, denial of Srebrenica genocide, denial of systematic destruction of 100 years old cultural, historical, and religious institutions by very well-known perpetrators and a reversal, uh, unfortunately, of the role of, of the victim and the perpetrator. This year's Remembering Srebrenica's topic is rebuilding lives. But prior to discussing it, I believe it's important to briefly address the ongoing denial and how challenging it is to live in a society of denial. Despite overwhelming and incontestable forensic evidence and unanimous rulings by world's most esteemed international courts, denial of Srebrenica genocide persists to this day, not just in, um, in Serbia and Serb-dominated part of Bosnia, but also around the world. And I'll provide you with some examples later on. So I will first like to refer to glorification of war criminals uh, and, and the ongoing nationalism. So we have been vit witnessing uh, an ongoing government sponsored attempt by the contemporary government of the RS um, entity in Bosnia that are engaging in revisionism of, of the events in Srebrenica. For those of you who may not be familiar, Bosnia uh, consists of two entities. One is the Federation of Bosnia and where Bosniaks and Croats predominantly live and the Serb dominated entity, which is called Republika Srpska or uh, RS. So in February 2019, at the initiative of the leading party in RS, the RS announced the establishment of the Independent International Commission for investigating the sufferings of all peoples in the Srebrenica region in the period from 1992 to 1995, as well as another commission with a mandate to investigate the wartime suffering of Serbs in Sarajevo. Very often, uh, politicians in, in, in the smaller entity in RS. Uh, they call Srebrenica genocide a fabricated, so-called a fabricated myth, uh, as well as, as one of the leaders, even, even the current uh, member of the BNH presidency. Uh, he called Srebrenica genocide the greatest deception of the 20th century. So this, this goes really for the Serbian, for the entire uh, Bosnian Serbian uh, leadership uh, in, in, in the smaller entity. And this is something that they really, that they, they come with these statements in the public uh, very, very often. Apart from the establishment of these investigative commissions, there have been several reported incidents in the municipality of Srebrenica after um, Grujic, uh, who is mayor, uh, was elected in 2016 as the first Serb mayor of uh, post-war post Srebrenica. There have been uh, also Islamophobic attempts of intimida intimidation of Bosnian population, uh, as well as an incident at Srebrenica's uh, first primary school where students were displaying uh, symbols of Serbian nationalism with barely any disciplinary action by their teachers or like the school administration, no action was taken whatsoever. 
So, but it's not really only the leadership itself. Uh, in addition to, to them uh, and the media outlets that do uh, promote them, denial of Srebrenica genocide is widely peddled by religious, uh, cultural, and educational institutions in RS. For example, the construction of uh, Budak Orthodox Church in 2013 near the Srebrenica Memorial Cemetery and the mass grave of uh, more than 8,362 victims uh, was actually um, was seen as, as a was seen as and condemned as a provocation by the uh, wider international community. Similarly, uh, and what is very dangerous in my view is that in schools and cultural centers across the entity RS and Serbia, children are taught alternative historical accounts of what was happening in Bosnia which either reverse the narrative of Srebrenica or they completely omit it. But again, uh, along this line, so in terms of, and, and in terms of what kind of message does the current uh, political leadership sends to future generations, uh, in 2016, a Serb member of the BNH presidency opened the doors of a public student dormitory uh, named by uh, Dr. Radovan Karadzic, uh, and it was like a present, like a gift to, to students at the University of Istočno Sarajevo in Pale, uh, which is very near the Bosnian, the Bosnian capital and, and in, the, in the entity RS. So only four days after the opening of the dormitory, the ICTY sentenced him to 40 years of prison. And uh, he was convicted uh, as a former president of Republika Srpska and supreme commander of its armed forces, uh, on accounts of genocide, crimes against humanity, and violations of the laws or customs of war uh, committed by Serb, Serb forces during the armed conflict uh, in Bosnia from 1992 to 1995. The next thing I would like to just briefly go through is the a very often um, disputed number and identities of Srebrenica's victims, uh, which is again, very dangerous in my view. Uh, revisionists attempt to minimize the death toll of, as I said, more than 8,362 victims, um, despite all the evidence and, and, and legal consensus uh, around this figure. Typical strategies of denial um, dispute the number of victims known to have perished in July uh, this, and, and the circumstances but that doesn't really end there. It goes to, the, to their very, very identities, um, identities of, of, of the victims. So the Bosnian Serb leaders frequently cite arbitrary figures as low as 2000 victims and deploy numerous conspiracy theories to explain um, the discrepancy between their calculations and the international consensus. So they, they assert that many of the Bosniaks buried in, uh, in the memorial cemetery died uh, of causes such as exhaustion, uh, that the majority were in fact killed uh, in combat as soldiers or terrorists rather than unarmed civilians. And finally, that, they, uh, that, they are, that the Bosniaks themselves are not even a legitimate people and that as such, they cannot be targeted uh, for, for um, targeted by genocide as such. And the last point I would like to make in terms of, of the uh, Srebrenica um, genocide denial goes to uh, various theories uh, around this uh, so-called conspiracy, anti-Serb conspiracy when it comes to international courts and tribunals. And uh, I would say this is one of the very often, if not mostly used tactics when it comes to denial, as, as they always, uh, as, as, as revisionists and, and deniers, they always seek to undermine the legitimacy of the international courts and tribunals. And of course, especially those um, whose investigations and judgments verdicts uh, affirm, affirm the fact that the, that the genocide uh, happened and who the perpetrators were. And so the, the, the most common approach relies on fabricated theories of international, uh, as I said, conspiracy and, and so-called bias, anti-serb bias uh, within the, the community and the legal institutions um, worldwide. 
So the question really remains uh, to, to be asked uh, remains. Uh, so what is what is our role and, and how how can we contribute um, despite this ongoing denial? So now I would just like to refer to to uh, to, to ways to rebuild lives and maybe some some examples how we can do it. So in terms of rebuilding our lives, I feel that um, on the one hand, it's it's facing the trauma of losing our loved ones. And on the, on the other hand, it's um, overcoming the pain and suffering as a result of ignorance and denial by perpetrators. And also um, the new generations that are being raised uh, in, in, in the post-war period. As I have mentioned, denial is very present at the individual, community, and institutional level in our society. But what I see as the only hope in rebuilding our societies is by working on new initiatives with those who share the same vision of our society uh, in the future, but no matter which um, religion or ethnicity uh, they belong to. Um, and and this, this vision really, uh, when, I, when I say the same vision of the society, I refer to a multi-ethnic, again, society, which Bosnia stands for, and uh, a prosperous society, because that's what I see as the only way to move forward. Also, I believe the role of survivors does not only lie in rebuilding our own societies, but others too, especially the most vulnerable ones who face the same oppression and challenges that we did. What we can really do is use our experience to make an impact on other refugees around the world, speaking out against hatred and intolerance in an effort to educate future generations. I believe one of the most powerful tools in tackling hatred and rebuilding uh, one's life, uh, just like many of our brave survivor, survivors of, of, of Srebrenica genocide did, is by pursuing justice, uh, meaning uh, reporting every perpetrator, although that can be very, very difficult and challenging and sensitive, especially uh, in the smaller entity uh, where these people live, by uh, witnessing, just like uh, many of them did before international courts and tribunal, and um, that's, that's definitely one of the ways. So pursuing justice uh, by any means we can. But also what's important is that events like these uh, platforms and space that are given to each one of us, they matter because uh, I feel that our stories are being told. I feel that someone wants to listen and that this is the way for them not to be forgotten. Even more importantly, by sharing our stories, we hope to be contributing in preventing uh, similar atrocities uh, from, from occurring somewhere else in any part of the globe. What you will notice, um, what I have been noticing uh, since I came back to Bosnia all, all these years is that um, none of these survivors of Bosnian genocide incites hatred uh, and calls uh, for new violence. But completely opposite, they always spread the messages of peace uh, and reconciliation. I believe that due to rising nationalism, just like Amra pointed out at, at the beginning, uh, due to rising nationalism, hate crimes, and racism in overall, and I don't think any, any country is exception to this really today, um, I believe to, that due, due to uh, rising of, of all these, of, of racism, uh, both regionally and worldwide, we need to speak about ongoing atrocities and the danger uh, that those represent to, to, to any, any of our societies to having safe and strong and, and more cohesive society. I also strongly believe that each one of us, of the survivors, has a role to play, no matter what our background is. Uh, we can do it through our jobs. I mean, of course, it, it also goes to the, to the governments, I mean, the, the governmental institutions, the educational uh, institutions, civic society, but it also comes back to each one of us and uh, what do we really do on a daily basis? Because we can tackle injustice 
and 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 we can we can really tackle denial on 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 daily basis. But unfortunately, we are also witnessing um, ongoing persecution and ethnic cleansing around the world, uh, as we can as as we could see from the events uh, that started in May in, in Palestine to Myanmar to Kashmir all over the world uh, and where I see the, the role of survivors uh, in speaking up on their behalf uh, just like for instance and I don't think we should ever forget that is how uh, ordinary people journalists whoever was speaking uh, on behalf of Bosnians 30 years ago so I feel that we should give it back now. And as a concluding remark, um, this is going to be a bit longer conclusion. Uh, I believe it's important to know that um, it's our responsibility to take action uh, to confront the ongoing trend of uh, Bosnian genocide denial, both locally and, um, and, and internationally. What we cannot let is uh, for the voices of revisionists uh, to silence the experience of survivors uh, if we do not want to, to witness the new potential conflict uh, and violence as a result of the ongoing genocide denial. I, will, I would like to just briefly illustrate how genocide against uh, Bosnian Muslims uh, has been a source of inspiration in some, in some of the most violent right-wing terror attacks in recent history. The 28-year-old white supremacist who murdered 51 Muslim worshippers in 2019 in Christchurch in New Zealand had the names of Serbian nationalists inscribed on the rifle he used to carry out the attacks. In the live stream video of the attack, he can be seen listening to a Czech war song glorifying uh, Radovan Karadzic immediately before the first shooting. The genocide against Bosnian Muslims in the 90s was, was also a source of inspiration for the uh, Norwegian extremist who gunned down 77 people in, uh, in a 2011 shooting. So no matter where we are, or as I said, which position we hold in our societies, we can all contribute to the fight against denial of the Srebrenica genocide on daily basis. Ordinary citizens have access to a range of public and private platforms through which they can and must take a stance against denial and constantly raise awareness about what was happening in Srebrenica, but also in, in, in Bosnia um, from 1992 to 1995. We are all empowered to champion truth and justice, whether through traditional sources of influence like uh, vocational or community leadership roles or modern communication technology uh, and social media networks. What's important is that within these venues, the word genocide must not be trivialized or substituted for any other milder or more ambiguous terminology like uh, massacre or ethnic cleansing. Also, I believe that criminalizing genocide denial is important and we have seen some steps, uh, but nothing really concrete has happened in, in, in that sense lately. Uh, I believe it's, a, it's an important step uh, on the road to justice in Bosnia and Herzegovina in order to impose a, a prison sentence for the genocide denial, as well as for uh, glorification of, of war criminals. Uh, because that's not really the society we should be raising our children uh, and, and um, looking to have some, some prosperous future. I also consider as a necessary step educational reform, although a very challenging one, of course. Uh, reform in sense of learning about historical facts um, equally around Bosnia, uh, as well as uh, educating younger generations about the about the Bosnian genocide, just like, for example, uh, rem remembering Srebrenica does. And finally, um, as I said, uh, I, I, I truly believe that it's our responsibility uh, to speak out uh, against genocide denial um, for the dignity of, of our victims 
um, healing of us of our survivors and um, more prosperous uh, future for for our children and and the um, and the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, editor, and thank you for your um, sort of powerful account of your own experiences, but also what you take from those experiences. Uh, to be honest, I find it, I find it amazing, really, that. Um, you know, just to quote what you said, that um, the survivors don't seek revenge, but they seek peace and reconciliation. Um, it's 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 so difficult to comprehend that as a position, because it shows that you, the the survivors, um, it shows an amazing amount of courage, really, um, and. Um, We've got a few questions coming in, and um, I'd sort of like to kick off the questions um, based on something else that you said. You said that the that there's a reversal of the role of the victim and the perpetrator, which we we saw in we see in Bosnia, but we see the world over. We saw it in the, the siege of Gaza recently. As a survivor of genocide, and you're absolutely right. You have to call it genocide because that's what it is. Uh, what would your um, advice be what would your counsel be to those people who are in a similar situation where they're the risk they're, they're the victims but they're being seen and portrayed as the perpetrators of a crime what would your advice and counsel be to those people in a similar situation it's really a tough one uh, to be honest um, I, d I just <sighs> So, so you, you, you mean uh, for someone who's portrayed as a victim? So we've seen, for example, in Palestine, mm -hmm. that the victims are being uh, portrayed as the perpetrators of the crime. And those mm -hmm. that are committing the crime are almost seen as being what they're doing in self-defense, almost reversing the reality. Um, and we've seen, again, you mentioned the Republic, Republic of Srpska uh, downplaying the, the genocide, saying that it was only 2,000 people calling it a crime, not calling it a genocide, almost reversing the blame. Um, I, can, I can only begin to imagine the psychological trauma that, that causes the victim. So I just wanted to get your take on that really, and mm -hmm. any counsel that you would offer to any other survivor in a similar situation. I see, I see. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think that's something that we have been seeing uh, in Bosnia, uh, even, even during the war, uh, from the embargo we had and then you know through equal uh, to somehow trying even during the war but even in in the post-war area uh era to 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 somehow um to make all the part all the sides equal just like you said happens in gaza where the where the uh the victim is actually portrayed as a uh, as a perpetrator um so what i can say and and what I have been seeing uh, by living in Mostar uh, for more than 10 years is that that was uh, happening on, a, on almost on a daily basis. You know, whenever uh, we are trying to, to um, let's say, commemorate some of the events uh, where we know, just like, like I said, when we have facts of uh, who was destroying the, the historical heritage, who was actually murdering, who is who's responsible for all the concentration camps, we have the reverse narrative, which says, no, no, you didn't do it. Uh, I mean, we didn't do it, you, you, you did. Uh, and it, it's very difficult to imagine that, you know, when, when it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to tackle it somehow. I mean, um, especially when you, when you talk to, to, to um, to the young ones, because they are pretty sure uh, that what their parents said to them, that that's, that's true, that they would lie to them, you know, they wouldn't just uh, make up stories. But I feel that somewhere uh, deep down, they are, they know, they know the truth, but it's, it's very hard to admit it. Thankfully, we have exceptions. I have, I have met some of the people who are from the other side, so-called, uh, uh, because don't get me wrong, but don't don't get me wrong. But I was I was raised in a, in 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 Mosta where we had always two sides. So, you know, it's us and them. And and um, when I when I started living in Sarajevo, that was that, that was a bit weird to me because there were no sides. Um, and and that that was also a very psychological thing. You know, uh, it's it's this this division all the time. 
Um, what I would advise in that sense is um, to either you're in the battlefield or you're a journalist or you are what in whatever role, just keep doing what you are. Uh, I'm sure that uh, if, if that's the right thing, of course, I'm sure that they will be those who will speak up on your behalf, just like I said, okay, maybe uh, definitely uh, Palestinians are deprived of so many rights, but there are those uh, who are uh, advocating for their cause, both in Palestine, um, as I have been following some of them, they're really active, uh, but they're really limited in their in their possibilities. So they are those, uh, we, we can do so much, we can raise awareness. So I guess it's, it's just really raising the awareness, um, uh, just trying to trying to stay in touch uh, and, and, and um, just raise awareness to the, to, to the maximum extent you can really from that situation, because that's what Bosnians also tried to do uh, throughout the siege uh, to, to, to convey the message of, of what was happening to us. But it was so challenging because uh, the world seemed to be very ignorant to it, just like it is now to, to Palestinians. Uh, they see it, but um, again, there were exceptions, of course, who were, who were helping us, uh, but the world just seemed to be Maybe, maybe, maybe they felt helpless in terms of what, what they can do. Um, just like I sometimes, I would like to, to help raise more awareness about Palestinian cause, but I'm limited. Um, and sometimes I think, okay, whether it's enough what I did, for example, I started uh, drafting some articles. I, I, I started researching about it, learning more to see what's happening because that was somehow very similar to what was happening to us. Uh, circumstances may be different, people may be different, uh, area where, where it's happening, it may be different, but at the end of the day, it's uh, it's cleansing. It's just slaughter, it's slaughter, it's, it's what it is. Uh, and sometimes I ask myself, okay, is it is it enough uh, if I, let's say, draft a blog about what's happening in Bosnia, about, what, about the provision of rights in the smaller entity or on what's happening in Palestine? Um, but maybe we shouldn't be overthinking that much. Maybe we should just start doing doing things and uh, let just write that article, post that tweet, uh, talk to some people. Maybe at the end of the day, it will influence someone else. And then I'm, I'm sure it will bounce back at some point. I mean, uh, it, it will reach the impact. Of course, it, it's, uh, it's very slow. It's, it's, it takes a lot of time. Uh, but uh, I think raising awareness is really is really the, the key um, is, is key to the, to this um, and and uh, yeah if for, for those um, who are seen as, as perpetrators, unfortunately. Thank you, editor. Thank you for giving us practical tips of sort of giving a voice to the voiceless. Um, I've had another question in which I'd, I'll open the floor up to Amra as well. Um, the question is how 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 do your families start to live again after the genocide? Um, so the, the question specifically, editor, was what was your experience when you went to Germany? How do you live life after what you've just been to the collective trauma? And this, the question applies to you, Amra, as well, because I can imagine in your sort of families there will be people who had direct experience of the the, the genocide and the, and the crimes. Um, you know, my mom still talks about the partition, the, the trauma of partition between India and Pakistan 70 years ago, whereas it's so, so much uh, more um, closer when it comes to you. How do you um, rebuild lives in that context? So that sort of I open the floor to Amra and, and to you as well, Amra, do you want to go first? Yes, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, it's one of those ones I look I look how it, um, the question starts with how and as I'm sure the editor can testify you don't have a choice like you just have to you you're thrown in the deep end is I think like uh, not, not a good enough but it's like colloquialism my my family have generations like I have four generations of my family that have survived concentration camps and this stems back to the Second World War. My great grandfather was a survivor of Auschwitz. Um, and then during the 90s, my great grandparents, all, all the way to, to one of my cousins, who was who'd only just turned one at the time, 
were imprisoned in different concentration camps. Um, when my parents were given um, what, resettlement, like within the UK, that was part um, to connect them with their family in London. And yet when they arrived to London, they were told that they were flying to Scotland in a couple of hours. They didn't have a choice. Like they came to a country where they didn't speak the language. They, they couldn't even place Scotland on a map. Um, and for, for anyone that's, that's told about the Scottish culture, like men in skirts and dragons and whatnot, and monsters in, in Loch Ness, it sounds horrendous. Um, it's, it's one of those you had to just continue life, whether or not you chose to. And unfortunately, for the majority of people that were displaced in the early years of war, it was a case of learning a language as quickly as possible, trying to find work, because uh, as a whole, the majority of Bosnians will, I, I like to think of us as, as hard workers. They wanted to start earning money. They had no possessions. They had no documentation. They had no connections. They had this belief that they would go back to Bosnia when the war ended. They thought it would be over soon. And then at the same time, being hooked to, to, to the news to try and find out what was happening, um, writing letters through the Red Cross to find out where, where their loved ones were, where they were. Like my, my, my family is spread all across the world, literally from uh, America to Australia. And there were periods of time that my parents didn't know where their siblings were, where their loved ones were, how they were going to get connected. And as, as life is, things happen even amongst this time like during during the period of my war of the war my one of my grandparents were living in Germany whilst my my parents were in, in Scotland and my grandfather got cancer and then you have this additional trauma of how do you go to see your loved ones when you have no documentation when you have no rights where you barely understand the language in order to try and go through this process and then at the same time when you do go back to Bosnia, it's not the country that you grew up in. Like before, before the war, this was Yugoslavia. There wasn't a, a Bosnia per se, it was just a republic. And you go back and from the moment that you reach the borders, you can, you feel this, you feel a difference. Like we, I remember the first, one of the first years that we went back, I think it was in like 2000, and I was just a child. And our car was followed from the border. I remember there was no bridges and we crossed the river on a, a wooden makeshift raft with our car. We came to, to Bosnia and my grandmother had a house built um, by an aid organization. And she was amongst one of the first to return back to, to Kozarac in 98, but there was no electricity. The water was turned off. We were taking water from wells. And we, we knew that the Serbian perpetrators, the, the the people that had put my parents in concentration camps were walking free and had never faced trial. Um, and yet they continued to do this. They continued to go back to Bosnia, to rebuild their homes, to make steps within the societies that they, they were now living in, be that in the UK, be that in Bosnia, be that anywhere else in the world. And the most remarkable thing of all, it's been touched upon as well is that they don't spread hatred, which is like, it's incredible. Even, even as a child of, of refugees and survivors and someone that works so closely with survivors, despite everything that people have gone through, they are spreading messages of justice and love to work with one another, to prevent this sort of stuff from happening. And thankfully, at least as, as far as we're all aware, there hasn't been acts of revenge. And to, to think of that, to see your perpetrators, to see the people that not only inflicted the, the works upon you and your family, but also know where your loved ones are buried. Like there are so many mass graves across the country and our family members and our loved ones and our friends are all hidden in these mass graves and not just as complete bodies, but in pieces, literally moved about by bulldozers in order to cover the evidence. And we are on this constant trail to find out any source of information to the point that people are being bribed by Bosnian Serbs or, or any other nationals, Bosnian Croats from the HRO, being bribed by them for, for money in order for them to give us the locations of, of these mass graves. 
more often than not that it turns out not to be to to be right but you long to have your loved ones to have a place to have a a, a cemetery or a burial place that you can go and visit them so it's it's a constant cycle like I, I probably haven't answered your question but there there is no answer um, and I think that one of the most important things that we can do is to prevent it happening from our from within our society like Bosnia was so integrated in Saturday of alone you have a cathedral an orthodox church a mosque and a synagogue all within walking distance of one another that you can hear the van you can hear the church bells all going up the same time like they lived as one. People were integrated. People married cross-culturally. Um, people had best friends from other races. It wasn't something that they were concerned about, but nationalism wedged it. It divided them and it served its purpose in turning people's mentalities. Um, sorry, I'm getting passionate about it. So <laughs> I'll let Edita kind of go on from that. So I think that kind of covers it. There's not quite an answer but you just have to I suppose can I just add to that so I'll never forget what my mom said to me um, so she was in her 30s when everything started happening and she was a um, happy cheerful young lady um, and she said I never believed that I could um, live through all that you know, um, get married, live for three years with my husband, get a child, start living this life. And then all of a sudden you're uh, moving to another country. Uh, you have no idea where your husband is because he, he stayed in the camp at that time. Uh, you have a child uh, who's three years old and you're going to, 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 to a country. Uh, you have no idea how you will earn uh, to survive. and I think it's one of the bravest, I'm sure you, 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 you uh, share my view, uh, Amra, uh, that our parents are really the bravest in the world and that she's like my, my strength. She has been my strength through all these years. But she herself said that uh, I, I didn't know. I just, I just, uh, and, you know, um, just, uh, provide her with education and whatever uh, she could at that time. So just like you said, it's, it's, it's moving forwards. No one really asks you, uh, but somehow you just, uh, you just live through it. And it, it was very challenging when we came back. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, Amra, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. The, the picture is sort of uh, not coming through, but we can hear you. Oh, okay, okay. I said it was just very challenging uh, when we came back uh, to Bosnia in 1997. Like you said, uh, Amra, same in Mostar, it was ruined. It was, I was, I was seven at that time and uh, I started, um, I, I actually, I started going to primary school uh, in, in, in Germany for one year and then, then we, we came back to Bosnia and I was thinking at that time, I was seven. What, what am I doing here? I mean, what, what kind of city is this, you know? And then you meet, you meet relatives that you never had chance to. That's the first time I saw my uh, grandmother and grand, grandfather. Uh, and, you know, and, and I'll, I'll never forget that me sitting in, 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 the, in the house, in, in, uh, in, the, in their house, and all these relatives, even themselves coming and hugging me, and I'm, I'm clueless who they were at that time. Uh, and then even more challenging part comes uh, going to school. So I was the first generation uh, of the so-called two schools under one roof program. So we were, uh, so what, what they tried to do is to have both Croats, Catholics and Bosniaks, Bosnian Muslims, uh, to have them uh, together under one roof uh, during the high school. So for four years, we were, we were so-called uh, the test generation uh, to see how that would, would, would work out. Uh, and that was extremely uh, traumatic experience, to be honest. It's just, you know, from the very first day, uh, they just teach you. It's just, uh, or, or at least you, you get the sense that you always belong to one side. You know, you're not supposed to do this. You're just not supposed to, to mingle and, you know, uh, and to have friends there because we are aware what 
what, what was happening, but still at the age of 15, uh, you're being taught, you know, not to interact that much. And then we had this ongoing violence. Um, we are pretty crazy about football here. Uh, and whenever we had match or something, uh, people go, they go crazy, they go wild. They, uh, and every like European league, whatever, World Cup, uh, we had uh, violence uh, in, in Mostar and, and sort of events. Uh, where one side was cheer for, cheering for, for, for one team and another, and another one for, for uh, another team. So that was just very, very challenging uh, throughout uh, all those years, I would say. But then again, um, at the age of 18, I moved to Sarajevo and that was a bit different. Uh, I went to American University where I met really people uh, from different backgrounds. And that's where I actually started uh, seeing that life in a Bosnian society can be different. Maybe Sarab is not the best example because we have all the ethnicities here. You know, maybe it's more challenging to live in these uh, communities such as Mostar, for example, or anywhere in RS uh, where it's predominantly, where, where, where one ethnicity uh, predominantly lives. Um, and then I went abroad for, for, uh, for some time. And I think that's when you really uh, change the perception you know, of, of, of what I should be doing about uh, all this uh, when I'm back. And, and, and uh, I think that's what I have been trying to do throughout some of the programs I attended. Uh, like I said, I've, I really tried to uh, make friends uh, with people uh, all, all around Bosnia uh, and, and um, yeah, somehow to, to, to work on some uh, great new initiatives. Like uh, we had one program last year. And it can be a very good experience. It becomes challenging at times when you discuss some of these topics uh, because everyone was, was raised by some different narrative. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the day, you know, no one questions what's what everyone thinks his, his own narrative is, is, uh, is, is, is the right one. And we somehow forget about the facts. Uh, but again, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Like, like Amra said, it, you really have to just live through it. And, and it's every day is a challenge. In a way, um, but yeah, that's that's what we do. I'm seeing some questions. Yeah. So, um, firstly, I'm conscious about time, Amr. I'm conscious that you've got an event to go to, but we've had a couple of questions. I hope you both of you could contribute to. The first mm -hmm. one is around the education system. So, um, with the Holocaust, the the the, uh, the Nazi Holocaust, it's become sort of entrenched within the UK education system to teach. Um, about the Holocaust, um, and I, I think the question is: Should more be done to um, include the, the Bosnian genocide within the education system? So that's the first question. And the second question, which um, isn't too unrelated, is about social media and um, almost a reluctance to, for people to speak out. Probably because, editor, based on what you said, people come with their own narratives. So there's a constant struggle against a counter narrative, and some people are less confident um, about sort of countering the counter narrative. Um, so, what what advice would you give those people who want to sort of speak out, but be, but they're faced with a counter narrative? So the first question is: should, should more be done about the education system? And the second is how 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 to support people who who want to challenge a counter narrative which isn't based on the truth. You want to go, Amra? Okay. Um, so obviously, the whole, the Holocaust is something that is taught and many people have heard of. Um, but often we say, once we once we've learned about the Holocaust, never again. And unfortunately, there's been at least nine international cases of genocide since the Holocaust. Um, obviously, Bosnia being one uh, in which Srebrenica was found, and during the time of the Bosnian War, you had Rwanda taking place. So you had multiple genocides occurring at the same time and genocide education is key, um, especially in today's society. And I think the thing with the Bosnian genocide is the fact that it happened within so many people's lifetimes. Um, obviously, like the new generation is growing, but they're surrounded by people that they don't even know have a connection to Bosnia, whether or not it was um, British military uh, going to, to support or provide uh, peacekeeping troops, um, whether or not it was British families and organisations that took in Bosnian refugees. 
um, that I've helped to support them, or whether or not it's even like family friends that people didn't even know um, were survivors. And I think that there was a, even a case at, uh, at this uh, Srebrenica event last year at Shakespeare Martin U, where one of the attendees didn't know that the speaker was uh, a survivor and had gone to college with him, I think. Uh, at least that's what I'd heard. Um, but we provide, as an organisation, um, we're, we're trying to, to get it established within, within our schools and education system because children especially can connect with it a lot. Um, they can see the words that we use in the propaganda and the media and, and such. They can hear the testimonies of survivors firsthand. And we have a wide range of, of resources for uh, educational institutions that they can use. Um, but as, as I'm sure everyone's aware, especially in this, this pandemic, teachers are, are overwhelmed um, and a subject that they don't have a lot of history on or don't have a lot of knowledge and expertise of um, makes them feel un uncomfortable in a sense and gives them uh, gives them that sort of hesitancy and I suppose that kind of stems on to people being open on social media we're always afraid of what other people will think and uh, we don't want to be picked on in essence no one wants to be bullied and unfortunately social media is rife with these sort of peoples and even working at the the organization um we we get a number of attacks um for example like recently uh, with the radical language appeal we had serbian nationalists that were posting glorification pictures all like in response to to us um and I know a number of survivors and myself included have been attacked by, by these people saying that we made up the stories of, of our loved ones, that there's no proof and evidence, even though we have the findings of the ICTY. And I think at the end of all this, um, regardless of what you do, you've made a choice. And whether or not you think by doing nothing, you're neutral, it's not in fact the case. Um, by not making a choice, you, I would say 99% of the time stand on the side of the oppressor and not the oppressed. And I always think that it's so much easier to, to prevent than it is to treat, as is with the case with Bosnia. This is the war ended 26 years ago almost, and yet we're still facing so many of the issues. And as a society, I'd like to think that if you were in that situation, you would want people to go to the ends of the earth in order to help you to get you out of that situation and i think we often forget that we are those people that can make a difference in others lives um i'm gonna have to to shoot away to it to another event um but thank you thank you for having us and it's been a pleasure as always and, and i look forward to seeing you, you next year hopefully <laughs> Thank you, Amber. I think um, um, well, hopefully we'll catch up after afterwards, and, and all the best for the for the rest of the week. Um, it must be a very difficult week for you and other survi survivors because you've got one week or a couple of weeks in July each year, where um, in a in a very strange way, perhaps you can draw some comfort because you speak to other survivors. But it must be a very very difficult time. So hats off to you um, and to your courage. Really. Thank you. Um, Edith, we, we, we've got you for a few more moments, hopefully. We've got a couple, a couple more questions, if that's okay. Of course, can... of course, of course. Let Amra go. Um, so question for you. Um, it says you, you mentioned being taught um, to divide from such a young age. How do you think these experiences shaped your outcome and your desire to promote peace and unity despite being uh, taught about division? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think uh, changing the, the, the environment, I mean, uh, going to a bigger city and then living abroad for some time, I think that all helped me. Uh, but at that time, I also felt that it, was, it, it wasn't right uh, for, for someone who is at that age uh, to, to, to be living in such, um, in such, a, in such, such a dividing society. So um, I think that the, the best way for us to learn uh, is from our, I mean, from our own own experiences uh, somehow, and and um, and I believe everything happens for a reason to some extent. So, and if I don't do anything, or if I just uh, if I'm uh, just being ignorant to an extent to what was happening, um, I, I 
I, I just think I've learned um, way too much by just trying to somehow trans transform that experience, that negative experience into something very positive you know uh and and uh, that hate speech and everything that i was uh, faced with at that time that i can uh use it for something that's that, that's more positive and I, I just wanted to add to the previous question in terms of education and social media uh i'm aware that people are reluctant uh when it comes to to, to posting and sharing their stories uh, and it's not easy uh, it, it may affect your profession your, your personal relationships and so on um to me, to be honest, uh, unimaginable to an extent to share my story this way, like two years ago. Um, but what I think uh, matters is to find a right platform or at least platform that you are com comfortable with. Uh, for me, that was Remembering Srebrenica. Uh, so I, I started attending their events last, uh, actually uh, one, one year and a half ago. Uh, and then uh, they, they had this uh, mini project last year where we drafted like 25 survivors from Bosnia for the 25th uh, anniversary. We drafted letters, uh, like our personal stories, just what I shared with you today. And that was the first time that I actually sat down and wrote my story. And th that was also dramatic to an extent, but it really, it, I think it helps me to heal to, to, to a certain extent. Um, and I feel comfortable, more comfortable now to, to talk about this. The first time I had events, uh, it was way more emotional for me, but somehow, you know, I'm just, I'm, I, I feel that at least a little bit, it's easier to me. Uh, but again, what helps is that there is someone who cares about it, someone who who's on the other side and, you know, who's willing to listen to your story. So um, find that, I think finding the right platform, maybe through organizations like Remembering Srebrenica can help uh, to, to spread your story. It doesn't have to be necessarily Twitter or, I don't know, some of these uh, most like famous social media or social networks. It, it can be just something, something that you are comfortable with. Um, Yes, so um, I think I think that's the comment. Maybe I, I I feel like I want to say so many things. It's just uh... I, was, I was just thinking that it'd be quite interesting to read your letter if you're happy to share it with us and perhaps we can circulate it to our guests. Of course, of course, I will. Um, I'm just a conscious of time and, and your time, um, but just an observation. Um, you, you don't re really get a feel for. Um, the, the Bosnian people, Bosniaks, the, the, the continuous hardships without sort of visiting Bosnia. Um, and um, so when I visited seven or so years ago, I, f I felt when I went to Srebrenica, I, I felt the palpable tension because it falls within the Republic of Srpska. And I couldn't comprehend that the women that I'm talking to are, who are telling us about their story are having to walk the streets next to the people that perpetrated the crimes against them and they're still free and you don't really well I, I it was so difficult to comprehend that that's the reality that they're living in it's it's unimaginable for, for us in the west to even comprehend that um and that's the the reality that there is this sort of current tension within the within the country um i, I welcome your comments on that and the second thing i'd welcome your comments on as a as a um you know with lockdown sort of easing um, I, I recommend a number of my friends to go and visit Sarajevo it's a beautiful country and you know the food's amazing the culture's amazing and again I'd, I'd welcome your comments on that you know what's there to see for, pe for people visiting Sarajevo definitely I agreed um, I invite all of you to come um, it's not it's because it's my homeland it's really beautiful country uh, with a lot of sightseeing a lot of history uh, nature for nature lovers so it's it's really what Bosnia is it's not only the capital uh, where everything is pretty much concentrated it's 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 the beautiful south um, and and uh, I, I don't know I, like there's nothing really I would uh, recommend but to visit all like many at least places not not all of them obviously it's impossible uh, th there, there is a tension I agree there there is always this sort of present tension um, but I'm also amazed, just like you said, by the strength. Uh, my, my father's first uh, cousin, she was she passed away two years ago. She was uh, 
in a concentration camp uh, during this time when the siege of Mostar was happening, uh, 1993. So she was in the camp, uh, she was beaten, raped, um, extremely difficult uh, experience. And I have never seen someone like her um, fighting so strongly about uh, for, for, for these causes and, 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 and for justice. So she was before the International Tribunal in Hague and, and uh, I'm not sure whether in front of uh, another court, but in, in before ICTY definitely. Uh, yeah, she, she was also before a national court here in Bosnia uh, for the war, war, uh, war crimes um, and, and cases on that. So, there, there is such resilience, and but at the same time, as, as I said before, she was never uh, filled with any hatred. Uh, she even said, "Okay, I have to do this on behalf of your father and all of the members, family members that we met that that, that we lost, because uh, I also lost my uncle. Um, he was he was killed in 1993 uh, during the conflict, and uh, other really many many family members. Uh, so she was doing this on behalf of them." But also, um, she took me to my uh, to my first uh, day when I started graduating. When I got the scholarship, she took me there because you know she wanted this legacy to stay. She wanted to provide me with new experience, uh, and and uh, I never heard any word, as I said, of, of, of intolerance or hatred or or anything from her. It was really always just peace. You know, you should be, she, she was always advising me like, uh, you should be uh, best in what you're doing, uh, keep on educating yourself uh, and, and so on. So um, it's just, it's amazing. It, to me, it's it's still, uh, it's still unthinkable how, how, where do they get this trend from? Because I, I was only, I was very young. I mean, I can, I'm somehow living this war throughout the experience of my parents, uh, through what was hap what happened to my father and through trauma of my mother, uh, but uh, just uh, being so so affected, so directly affected, you know, by the war crimes, and still having resilience, and and still just uh, uh, just being so strong, it's 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 just incredible. Thank you. Um, we're going to bring the event to a, to a close, if that's okay. Um, just my last observation: you mentioned that your aunt about your auntie's resilience. Um, I'm sure she'd be very proud of you because, in the very short period of time that I've got to know you and this event, I can, I can sort of see that resilience and that strength in you as well. So um, I'm sure she she'd be very proud of you. Um, thank you for the time that you've given to us, and really, there's so many takeaways from from your testimony um, and the testimony of Amra and for the people attending and the people sort of listening to this on social media, I think um, if there was one key message that you'd like for them to take away, what would that be? Thank you so much. Um, I think it would be to um, stay aware of what, what's happening around us. Let's not be ignorant um, because What's really happening to, to uh, let's say, Palestinians at this moment? It's something that really deeply affects us, uh, and and I sh I think we should do whatever we can. And um, sometimes it takes time, uh, but but let's just raise awareness about any cause. It doesn't really have to be. This is um, this is something that's um, close to me. That's why I'm saying it. Uh, but any any cause that they think is worth fighting for, I think they should because it matters. At the end of the day, it matters. To me, it matters that uh, I had you and all other participants today here uh, listening to my story. And, and that really matters. And thank you for that. Thank you. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, by, by all means, um, please. Sir. Ask editor or editor if you if you've uh, if we can subsequently um, sort of stay in touch perhaps by email etc because it would be quite interesting to uh, read your letter and maybe share that with the rest of the participants here as well. Definitely, definitely, and and if there are any other questions, you can always reach me through LinkedIn or my email. I'll be happy to uh, to let you more, to let you know more about uh, living in Bosnia. That's great. 
what we'll do challenges. Is, yeah, thank you. What we'll do is we'll um, um, when we sort of send this out to social media, um, we'll link your name into LinkedIn as well from our social media sort of page, so people can connect to you directly as well, connect with you directly as well. Great. Thank you so much. I hope the rest of this week is sort of um, I appreciate it'll be a very difficult week for you, but um, you know, all the very best. And carry on Thank doing you. July is always um, the tough one, the toughest in the year. Mm -hmm. yeah, but we have to keep working. We'll, we'll keep working. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.